What up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Jesse Warden, and today we're going to talk about Angular if you're a backbone person, right? This is a quick crash course, get her done. What we're going to do is going to cover random order of things that I found that backbone developers ask me all the time. They, they've been doing it for years. They've been doing jQuery for years. They come to me, Jesse, you seem to know Angular. Oh, sure. Uh, can you help me understand the differences from backbone? You know, I'm doing my first Angular project. What can I do? They always ask me the same question. I think because coming from ba you know backbone and Angular are very, very different in how they approach things. And if you've been doing backbone for a while, you're very entrenched. And what's even more interesting is backbone is still immensely requested by people, not just for the backwards compatibility support from older browsers, but just because it's modular fashion that, you know, bolt on what you need, where Angular is kind of like, this is what you use. We're like Cintra, but not as big. I'm going to cover some random things, give you up to speed. Ready? Here we go. Number one, you build views via partials or directives. That's the two ways of building Angular applications. It's not on purpose. It's just kind of what the community does. And Backbone, all you use is partials. So you have your controller class, right? And you you make it do things. And sometimes you get a little fancy with handlebar templates to inject models, right? But usually in Backbone, it's one line of the template and injects the model and render, you know, repaints the screen or re-injects the model. That's usually what it does. So for example, Backbone, for the most part, has a render function, right, which draws things via jQuery, inspects the model, and makes smart recommendations on how to re-render those things like that. Uh, classes like Marionette and other framework adapters allow you to uh, make that a little easier to work with, a little more efficient for some particular you know, subviews and things like that. They handle all that. The messaging, it's all in there, right? But that's generally how it's viewed. You draw it here, and you lay it out in the actual HTML. And so we find the selectors here, usually IDs. <laughs> Right, sometimes, or classes, right? And that's how you're you're targeting what you're injecting to, right? So some of these things you know in your head or searching in the in the code, that particular ID has a class association. Class meaning uh, an immediately executing function which extends a backbone view. Angular is the exact opposite. So while backbone is MVC, Angular is MVP. We actually build little views without all this render stuff, right? And you you actually encapsulate the events. Uh, in the element, <laughs> right, and the render and the template all in the same thing. Building from a partials perspective, it's very familiar, right? You go into Angular app and you're, you know, building HTML. You're using some weird tags here, like in weird attributes, okay? You may have custom tags that look strange to you, but for the most part, it's very similar to Backbone. Create some HTML, it has some events, and some JavaScript responds to that. Gives me data for my model. Okay, so far, so good from a familiarity perspective. Where things get whack is directives. So from an MVP perspective, if you're familiar with MVP versus MVC, MVC, that the view doesn't touch the controller. The controller can manipulate it, right? Treating it like Martin Fowler's passive view. So the view in Backbone is almost like a passive view with the HTML, and the actual view class is more like a controller. It really depends on your opinion, but that doesn't matter. The point is that Backbone views, from the HTML perspective, do not latch on. Right, the backbone view handles all of that. It handles the events, handles the setting, handles the model, good to go. P, the, the view is actually allowed to talk to the presenter. And I don't just mean events, like I'm in events, you can opt into these if you want. No, he has to have an instance of the controller inside of his class through some form of composition to actually call method calls on that. Completely opposite of backbone. This is the number one thing that backbone people go, oh my god, right, it's MVP. It's the future. Microsoft saw it was the future, reinvented it, called it MVVM or model view, view model, whatever. Same thing. All you need to know is Backbone, MVC, Angular, MVP, and you can actually talk to it. The, the view can actually make calls in this controller. Now, why would you want to do that? Why? The point of that in Angular is that you can actually unit test the controller independent, right? It has no DOM, no view, no nothing. If you've ever tried to mock testing a Backbone view, unless you can find an easy way to uh, mock jQuery. It can be a little challenging, right? Because it has dependencies on models and things like that. Angular has the same problems, but the way you were given those things is through the dependency injection framework, so it makes it a little simple, okay? So that's all you need to know. You can either build through partials, right, and use a router to link to those partials, just like you do in Backbone, right? Little pages, okay? And then you use router to link to them. Or you can build directives, which are custom attributes and custom tags, okay? Why custom attributes versus custom tags? Simple example, makes it really simple. So Simple example makes it really simple. Well, duh. Click. If I'm going to click on the toggle all, there's a selector I want to know when I clicked on it. In Backbone, you merely just register with the events. It actually knows to look for this particular selector and or class, whatever you put in there in that syntax. Click, and you get a method call. Ta-da. You even get the mouse event. You actually know where it came from and the current target versus event target, blah, 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 right? All handled for you. 
nice, concise, very common convention syntax. But that implies click works. That's the great misunderstanding here of how it works. What do you mean it doesn't work, Jesse? I've been doing Backbone for years using click handler. It works great. No, actually it doesn't. Let's talk about that. There are many different types of clicks on things you're typing and clicking on. Many jQuery and web developers take this for granted. They are really, really intelligent, have a lot of experience in understanding the different types of clicks, and they kind of blend it into together because they think you know what they mean. The ng click. Again, there are two types of directives. Directives called attribute directives, right? They're actually on the attribute. Angular doesn't call them that. <laughs> That's what I call them because it's English. Okay, so ng click. ng is just a namespace. If you know anything about XML namespacing, they have this really horrible syntax using colons and everything else. Angular and a lot of other people have given up on that annoying syntax. You know, it reminds them of Java soap or something. What they do is they say ng dash, right? That is ng stands for Angular. Okay, so when you see ng, you know it's Angular. You can make your own and are encouraged to make your own, so you don't make your own click directive, right? And it collides with HTML5 or future semantic standards, whatever. If you make your own, you know, usually like I don't know, cow dash click, that's good. Make something up. This click, unlike a on click or a click from a DOM event handler, you know, clicks it handles, it calls the count and increments this variable. Okay. Knows double binding, somewhat similar to handlebars in terms of you can binding to that kind of stuff, but double binding is actually built in. What about an anchor tag? What if the anchor tag has, uh, I don't know, a pound sign for the actual target because we're actually going to handle the click later and actually go into somewhere else on the page? It works very differently on different browsers, right? So you have to know that. These are the kind of things that web developers, especially backbone kids who grew up on jQuery and became powerful application developers, they take for granted. And they seem to think that you know some of these new ones are coming around, they'll just memorize them because they've been doing it for years. That's fine, but not everyone is cool as you are. Some of us are dumb. <laughs> we come from languages where if you make a click, it works on things that are clickable. That's not how the web works. So let me give you an example. Let's go into source code and see what is ng-click really doing? It doesn't take anything into account with forms or elements in forms or preventing to submit. None of that. We're not worrying about clicks around that, right? All we're interested in is without changing the location or causing page reloads, right? Very something very similar when you're doing clicks on an um, actual hyperlink. There are a variety of tricks to make the page act a certain way, show certain things in the status bar, friendly navigate to certain pages when you've actually attempted to use JavaScript. IE8 and other browsers less than that get really funky when you have blanks or null in there and they do different behavior. It handles all that. Even something as simple as I have a decorated SVG document and I'd like to make some of it clickable, right, or hyperlink within that S S SVG document, it uses a completely different attribute for that. They handle all that for you. You want to make something clickable, you want to make it act like a button, all this handles for you. In effect, you're extending or fixing polyfilling, right, the behavior of HTML. That's what you're really doing. You're just extending it. It has nothing to do with HTML. It has nothing to do with CSS. This is all JavaScript. So all you're doing is extending the power of HTML with JavaScript. This is very similar to where web components are going, where you actually are building classes to merge with custom tags. In this case, we're doing it with attributes. You can do it with tags as well. All this code about restrict and compile and blah, blah, blah. All you care about is this. That's all it's doing. It's just normal JavaScript that extending it. Going back to like, yeah, but Backbone, I can just use click. Well, most Backbone developers are smart enough to either know these things or just use simple divs, okay? For those of us coming from Angular who want to decorate our document and make it, you know, get her done, ng-click takes care of that. It takes care of all the form, usually, <laughs> side cases for submit, all that kind of stuff, right? So these are attribute directives. Now, I'm not going to show you an Angular directive because I think Angular kind of does it in a very imperative way, right? It uses JavaScript to actually create that and then link to the, the template file. Very similar to how you link to a template file through Require.js using the Handlebars plugin, right? In some backbone projects, you say, this is my view class and it links to this template. So then I can inject the template. That's fine, but it's very imperative. It's JavaScript. It's not very designing, right? A lot of designers and component developers who are hybrids, they're good at CSS and good at HTML, and they know a little bit of JavaScript, right? Very, very powerful, right? JavaScript developers, excuse me. So if you take that and give them the ability to assemble these components in a normal, you know, fashion where you have reusable components that look and work the same and are encapsulated, you know, you, you can create some really compelling applications. That's where Angular's tag directives really take off. I just don't like the syntax. I think it's backwards, right? I think Polymer does it well, and it illustrates a better kind of way of visually seeing how you would put an Angular application 
by not using partials, right? But you're using partials, but you're actually creating components. So instead of partials that could be, you know, huge, right? Really pages and pages and pages. So it's a single page app, right? But it's really just a bunch of pages that you swap, right? Do some magic jQuery router magic. In this case, you're building elements or components. So let me show you what it looks like. I've posted this link before, but the guy puts a really good example of here is a polymer element, right? All it is is a custom tag, right, polymer element, which allows you to construct your own tags. So for example, if you want to use Google Maps as part of your DOM like this, you can do that, right? And you can actually play with the attributes. Every time you change the attribute value, whether by hand or through jQuery or some other dynamic way through JavaScript, it'll actually update the model and data on that component. Polymer does the same thing. It's just like Angular, right? The difference is, is that you use this polymer element tag Right, give it a name, so it's going to look like user dash gravatar. Okay, that's the name of it, and you can find attributes and everything else. And the template is a official HTML5 standard template tag to put DOM and script and things in there that you don't actually want to run. And this is not display none and off the page somewhere. This is like don't run scripts, don't run image tags and make them fail on 404, even, even if I have injected my dynamic you know, name for it, blah, blah, blah. Like none of this stuff will happen in newer browsers, okay? Then you say, all right, associate a script with it. You can also say a source so you can keep your Polymer definition separate from your Angular code. Very similar to handlebars being the actual HTML or J template and backbone view being separate. It's very similar. The difference is this is very declarative, right, where this is the same way you do the exact same thing in Angular. You actually do it all in JavaScript, right? Define your directive, give the user gravatar name, and do this weird stuff, right? And then link to your template. So linking to your template is, as this gets larger, you would actually externalize it into an HTML file that's, you know, usually right next to it. Some people use the .tpl extension, whatever. The point is, is that I think Polymer gives you an example of how, okay, I'm creating a, a bunch of components or tags. The same exact thing you're doing when you restrict it to an E. That means a tag. I know, it's... Don't get me started on the, the weird steampunk gear reasons they made up for these names. What do you do when you get something like this? Well, it's not just a component like Google Maps. We're talking about composition here. And there's, it's not shown here, but there's a property called transclude equals true, which really means I'm a container. If you don't put transclude or you put transclude there equals false, the same thing as I'm not a container. So you can't put things in it. Well, putting things in it is where we get with composition, right, of creating components that we can compose into other components. What does that mean, Jesse? You go to the Polymer Project website, and you scroll down to the Paper Elements. Paper Elements, or Paper, is the new design thing from Google, right? It was released in I.O. a few month, uh, weeks ago, months ago. God, time flies. And what's neat about it is they are utilizing HTML5 to prototype how it's going to look on mobile, right? Because it's faster for them to go blah, 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 in JavaScript and then go, all right, that's good. And then the Java guys go, okay. And then they build in Java, right, for the Android SDK. So paper is kind of like a neat way for them to experiment. It's also neat for Google to have an all-encompassing design, right? So if you're building a PhoneGap app, and you're going to use HTML5 like Instagram did, right, to actually wrap it in the PhoneGap app and then deploy to your Android phone, cold, dead hands. Then what you can do is use paper and have a consistent look and feel. It's mobile first. It's built for mobile. It looks for mobile. Okay, and if we look at some of the demos here, you can see some of the container ones. That's what I want to really show you. So we know what a checkbox is, right? A checkbox is a component. So you can build this in an Angular directive or a Polymer directive, whatever. But when you're building Angular directives that are transclude, you can put things in them. So for example, let's look at a dialogue. A dialogue is just something as simple as this, right? But you can put things within it. You can put text and text files and buttons, right, and things like that. That is what a transcluded directive or a component, right, Polymer, that actually can put things in it. That's one of the most powerful things is that you're building these components as you build Angular. Now, in Backbone, you just make a simple view or a Marionette subview, and it would actually, you know, encapsulate in. So it's not, nothing different than you've been doing, right? It's just you have a partial HTML, and you have code wrapped around it, right? So very similar. It's just that... Some people don't get the web component model. They don't think in building components. They think in pages. So for them, building a bunch of partials, right, and having a controller associated with that, very similar to Backbone View, and having the router, you know, flip out those partials, that to them is, like, very similar to the web page model or even the jQuery model. So that's why you have a lot of people who don't write a lot of directives, okay? Some people write a, a lot of directives, but they actually make them attributes. They would rather decorate divs than see custom tags 
in the browser and they don't know what they are, like cow, tab, or whatever else. I think it makes this, the markup more semantic and you actually read it. What do I mean by semantic markup? Read it later. Well, let's look at another container here. We'll go to the core elements. Okay, core elements are the core ones that every, everything else has built right. So the scroll header, this scroll header itself is actually a polymer element. But if we inspect it, okay, you'll notice that at the right here there is a core drawer panel. That is the custom tag. You can do the same thing in Angular with Angular Directive. But when we open it up, it has other things within it, right? You're composing. So why don't we drill down to the toolbar? You can see the toolbar right there. And we drill down to the contents of the toolbar, which is our custom div stuff, okay? Very similar to what you do in Backbone, but that would be like div soup. In this case, Angular or Polymer, right? It's the same thing. You actually create these directives or these components and there's things in them. That is the biggest paradigm shift ever. Go look at the difference between if you're uh, coding Angular. When you're building a directive, just look through the different ways you can do it, either as an attribute or as a tag. For example, there is no ng enter <laughs> in Angular. So when you're typing in a text field and you hit enter, right, versus having to click the login or submit button, doesn't exist. Right? You can code it yourself. You can just say a simple key down uh, element. And if you're curious, yes, element is a jQuery Lite. So you don't include jQuery with your project. It's actually kind of included a jQuery Lite version. So you have the minimal amount of DOM things that you need from an abstraction perspective with some helper methods too. So you can use raw JavaScript if you wanted to, but these directives give you this. So if you're wondering where does my jQuery go, it goes in the directive. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, but it's a big joke. Like, where does my jQuery go? You're not supposed to reuse jQuery. Yeah, you do. Elements, basically jQuery, and sometimes it doesn't work, and you have to use jQuery anyway. Let's talk about closures everywhere. So if you're from a backbone perspective, you're used to classes that are using the underscore built-in stuff, right? So extend, it wraps things on prototype, and the theory is, is that if you use an object at prototype, you have a really fast code. Irrespective of the fact that many of today's JavaScript thought leaders are utilizing a closure-based approach, such as objects that return within immediately executing functions. So they're forgoing object prototype. The V8 JavaScript runtime thingamabob in Chrome is optimized for closures and traits and all of the other wonderful things that JavaScript has coming down the pipe and has today that they've optimized. So using objects without prototype is not a penalty. You will, you will not create apps that no one can use, okay? Closures are a very you know, normal thing to do. But it gets a lot of slack, whatever. You can use object prototype in Angular. The problem is, is that Angular is influenced very much so by the functional crowd, right? So you tend to have a lot of functional crowd people using functions and objects. They're not using object at prototype, which is a very oop, you know, object-oriented programming, Java, large application background, right? Which goes against everything I said about targeting enterprise before, right? Mm. Mm. That's how it works. That's just what they do. You can use object prototype. Majority of the code you're finding is going to be closure-based. When you extend a class, a lot of the classes are favoring composition over inheritance. So you're not going to see backbone view extend. What you're going to see is stuff like this, where you just have a simple function. Very similar to callbacks and a lot of other things where you actually give a function to a particular thing and it gives it back. And it usually will instantiate it for you. You could do object prototype if you want, but most of these directives and controllers and things like that are wrapped around that. For example, building a controller, very similar to a backbone view, right? It's just a function and you can put it in there. A lot of people don't do that. What they do is they do stuff like this. Where they go uh, function application controller, and then they nest like that. And then you get a bunch of nested brackets, and you're like, oh my gosh, the functional rabbit hole is so deep. How far does it go? I hope WebStorm saves me with its alignment arrows. Oh my god, they disappeared. What do I do? Everyone has their own different syntax. You can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. It's not a bad thing. Everyone codes Angular differently, <laughs> including the classes. Some use object prototypes, some use closures. Don't worry about it. Most use closures. Their apps run just fine. Double binding. Let's go back to our demo here of ng-click. So a normal backbone way of binding is to listen for an event on the model and or, or a particular control and then handle that. So for example, if I were to increment a value, I would listen for the increments on the up or down arrows and modify the model if I was allowed to, right? I, I could use whatever application logic I was allowed to prevent or allow that to happen to update the model, right? No dynamic -y update. I could possibly call a render again, whatever else. Or you could use one of the plugins that actually enables double binding into Backbone. And I think Marionette has some stuff like that. But anyway, point is, is that it's again, the typical Backbone mentality, bolt on, right? That kind of thing. When the model changes, you call render in an efficient fashion. 
Angular does all that for you. Double binding. It's just the double brackets like this, right? So count's going to increment, right? Every time we increment the count, right, from this particular variable, it's right. Like, this right here is a model. Any object is a model in Angular. So we're incrementing count, and it's double binding like that. It knows to inject that particular section of the HTML from these parsed areas. It knows how to do that, and it has a variety of steps that it does for compiling and parsing to make sure that it's parsing the HTML correctly. So very similar to handlebars to handle you know, cross-site injection attacks, update a particular model in a particular section of the DOM. It handles all that. The difference is, is that this also can be wrapped around. They usually have, on just about every tag, a way to remap it. So you can either A, say on ng click, I want to increment count, but you can also use something such as, we're going to scroll down and you'll see a bunch of them, and it's something called an ng uh, change. So for example, when an item changes, right, in this case an input, we can bind it to something. So when you're typing uh, in a text box or something, you can actually see a change and it'll update a model. Next thought is, okay, I'll put it in there, I'll say click equals whatever the input text box. No. What you can actually do is use something called ng model, which works on a variety of different um, controls, and it allows you to double bind. So you can bind to a, uh, an input tag and a script. The way double binding works is that if you use this ng model on that particular model, anytime you type, it'll actually update that model. So it knows that ng model is associated with an input, and an input fires a change event. So it needs to take that change event and wire that to that for a user-specific event. So as I'm typing, it'll update the other one. As I'm typing this one, it updates the other one, right? So it's updating the model, double binding for both controls and models. The point is, is that Angular has it built in, Backbone has plugins for it. Same stuff you already been doing, no change, okay? It's just the concept is that it's so amazing that ng model, the directive can adapt to any tag I put it on. Whee! It's cool. It's useful, it's awesome, but it's not like, oh my god, Angular is so much better than Backbone because we already have this. The point is that it's not nothing new. Before we go any further, let's talk about browser support. Backbone works for IE6, N7, N8, N9. Angular, a little different. Angular does not work for IE6. Angular does work for IE7, but it's not really supported at all. So as far as you're concerned, it's not supported for IE7. You can make it work with certain polyfills for certain functionality. Most of your problems in IE7 are not just JavaScript. It's usually design and things like that, right? Trying to get bootstrap and all that other stuff to behave. So you can make it work, but it's, it's generally frowned upon that Angular is not IE7 friendly, okay? So it's definitely going to work for IE8. Here's the problem with IE8. IE8 is getting dropped in 1.3. As the time of this video, we're currently at Angular 1.2. 1.3 is... is, is not going to fix any new bugs for IE8. So if you want certain things to fix in IE8, the core team is not going to work on it. So don't hold your breath. Good news is most of us are being able to leapfrog from IE, you know, eight or seven, all the way up to ten or eleven because of Vista and Windows Seven and all this other nonsense that we missed in Vista, right? Plus Microsoft's killing all the browsers by next year, so they're forcing everyone to IE11, and they're trying to encourage people on the greenfield philosophy, greenfield, green browser, whatever. Dependency injection. Dependency injection is a rabbit hole. If you don't know anything about a dependency injection, uh, there's a really good article that helps give it a visual look and feel. So you can actually look at simpler code than the functional way that the Angular does it, right? All dependency injection is, if you don't know about it, you can go read Martin Fowler's you know, long article. It just means that when I ask for something, instead of saying new whatever, just give me an instance or give me a singleton or give me a factory function that creates it. I don't care how you do it, just give it to me. And all I want to do is ask for a string. It's called the new new, right? What that means is, is that you inverse the control. So a common problem you have in Backbone, for example, it's not a problem, but it's just a common common thing. I want, I have a, a view. So I have my, my new view something, right? I've got to put a model in there somewhere, which implies that I already have some model already ready, right? It's some model, in, it could be an instance. Could be uh, another class you got from require that made it a singleton. Doesn't matter. The point is that this has to exist, which means that this has to exist as you're new in it, which means that some class, in this case ASDFJS, knows about these two classes, maybe from require, importing both of them, right, and puts it in an instance. Now that'll work for small projects, but as your projects grow, you have like 10 people committing to the same code base. You have the node guy is struggling to give you a really consistent data model from the back end that the Java developers are like, so uh, I can't change my code. What do you do, right? So the dependency injection helps solve that. 
it gets rid of this and it says, hey, look, just don't worry about it. It's a magic string. I'll get you some instance, okay? Don't worry about it. The cool thing is it doesn't actually run until this actually fires. You can even treat that with views as well. The whole point of dependency injection is I'm going to give you a string. I want you to give me an instance when I actually run, okay? So you can define it ahead of time or whatever else. Python and Java use annotations at the top. They'll go like um, if you want a bar, let's say, some value. You can actually say this is a model of type uh, person model, right? And when this class is actually run or instantiated, it'll actually read through the annotations, inject that person model value for you, and you're good to go, right? It's actually a new person model. That's kind of how dependency injection works. However, it does something different at unit test time. What do you mean by unit test time? Well, how do you have this ready when you're unit testing? What, what if I just want to unit test one class? Do I have to drag in 50 other classes? No. That's one of the things that unit testing helps is that you can inject those instances or mock them, right? Not a fixture. Like you're just pretending to be mocked. So for example, a common thing you'll see in JavaScript is this. You know you're screwed when you see this because it's a global. If you see a global, someone who's either in a hurry or didn't have knowledge of how to abstract globals away, and you know you're going to find more of them, right? They're going to be in there somewhere. So things like this are bad. So Angular gives you this, for example. What this means is it can be mocked. So if you're using unit test, it can emulate Windows behavior. It can even bind dynamic, right, and, and allow all your unit tests to work. So they don't actually have to pull in a global variable with certain values expected in a window. Same thing with your model classes. If you want specific data or methods to be called in a certain order in your models, you can mock all of that, right? And dependency injection handles all that for you. So let's talk about why, you know, that's a, that's a, a brief primer on dependency injection. You're going to have to read it all your own. But bottom line, that's what Angular does for factory and provider and service and constant and value. It's just another way to do it. How of code guy. And he has what I believe is a really simple and good example. He takes all the Angular and the stuff and says, look, take the functional out of it, take the Angular out of it. What are we really doing with dependency injection in Angular? Dependency injection is different on what language you know supports it. There was one in Backbone that only supported instances. It had no support for constants, no support for values, no support for singletons, designated between singleton and instances, no support for factory functions, no support for creating your own instance and whether it was lazy, whether it used a cache, none of that, right? So when you are reading the Angular stuff and from a difference between a factory and a service, you, it gets really confusing if you've never even had any experience with dependency injection before, right? So I think it's first, just like Ruby on Rails, it's good to know Ruby. <laughs> Rails gets really fun, then you, know, you start to realize how much you don't know about Ruby. Well, this is the same thing. Read this article. He gives you a good understanding about it. It's tauofcode.net, studying the Angular injector, the twin injectors. He goes through every single one, gives you an idea of what it really is doing from a pseudocode perspective, so it you know, really gels. Okay. Once you get that on the AngularJS wiki, which basically says understanding, understanding dependency injection, where they talk about providers and the different factory functions and things like that, right, with all the injectors that actually do it, okay? So two good articles, read it in that order. That way when you come to here, you're like, oh, I already know what that means, right? You'd be awesome. If you, you know, drop the words DI or inversion of control or IOC, right, in front of Java developers and enterprise, they get really impressed, like, whoa, JavaScript has DI? It's like, yeah, I know, it's like 2008. Can you believe it? I know, I just, they're Java, I gotta make fun of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's all love. It's a love. Unit testing controllers, right. This is the whole point of why uh, people is in the enterprise sphere got really excited about Angular because on the front page of the tutorial, you're unit testing your controllers. So what does that really mean? Well, let's, let's do one right now. I'll actually do it live coding, man. We'll go to our application controller, and we'll give it a method. So a lot of people will do scope. They'll do VMs. They'll do all kinds of weird things. We're going to do scope for now. Scope is the same thing as this in a backbone view. Okay, so if you want to know what view you're talking to or what model, it's this in the backbone view. And Angular is just scope for now. That's all you need to know. So we'll say some method equals this. Actually, we'll just do something simpler. We'll say call sup some method. When you actually go to your, you notice I put the, the ng controller, right? It says for this HTML document, uh, whose controller is it, right? Application controller. It's very different where you actually have to designate an ID in Backbone and say that ID, that, that main dude, him and his contents are associated with this class. 
In Angular, you actually go to the HTML and say, this div on down, or HTML on down, or body tag, or whatever, right, associated with this controller class. So it knows to look up that controller, okay, through magic. So how do you call it? Well, let's, uh, let's make a div. So we'll go over here and make a div. And we'll go ng-click, some method. Done. That's how you call methods of the controller, right? So this concept of allowing a view to actually have an instance of the controller that it knows about and be able to call methods on it is very alien to a lot of us who grew up and you know keep the view pure, right? And let it do its animation and interactivity and custom design and don't break the grid, right? You put code on top of it. This is the opposite. This is no, no. We're going to enhance HTML. We're going to use it to build components and we're going to make it call methods. Why? Because when you want to have a mock the HTML, it's really simple to just call method. You don't need to put all this HTML and stuff like this in a unit test. You just actually call the method on the controller, right? Pretty cool. And because the controller uses the dependency injection, right? See this thing or ng inject? You can also use the old school inject of, you know, I'm asking for something kind of like you do in require. You say underscore actually means, you know, the JavaScript file here. This scope is going to be a dependency injection. So in a unit test, it's actually a, a completely different scope. Still has this, has scope, everything else is good to go, okay? Here is my model in Angular. Now you'll notice that most of the stuff looks the same. Implement this. The difference is that we don't extend anything. So we're not a prototype based templating class wrapper for object prototype. It's just a simple object, okay? The way Angular gets away with this is two ways. Now also, Angular is not the only thing to do this with, okay? Polymer does it as well, but it has a completely different mechanism for making it work. Backbone had to support pre-object-defined property, right? Object-defined property doesn't even work right in IE8 or 9, whatever it is. We're only with some DOM elements, but defined property allows you to create getters and setters, right? So instead of saying my model instance set first name and then the value of cow, right? That's what you had to do to support the older browsers. You would have to do uh, sets because some browsers supported object, you know, getter setters differently. It was just ridiculous. So if you have a get and set, it works great and it allows you to encapsulate uh, basically the strategy pattern. You can pass in all kinds of things to set on how the model updates. Uh, if you want to do multiple updates at the same time, before sending a change event, you know, to the built-in event bus, all that stuff was built in nice and really awesome. Angular doesn't have that. Because when you set an object, how does it know? <laughs> like, the object divine property doesn't work yet. So what is it doing? Well, it wraps every single change in something called a digest loop. There's all kinds of other wrappers, right? There's try-catch wrappers and all this other digest loop and everything else. But basically, there's a part in when your code runs inside of Angular, right? It knows to check the object and see if it's changed. And it has some optimized ways of doing this, right? And some bugs that it works around, blah, blah, blah. But the reason it does that is that your models look really simple, require no class, they're plain JavaScript vanilla objects. Now your, your first thought is, okay, but why does this matter? Well, because of this. That works in Chrome 36. So as of last month, you can now do it in Chrome. I believe Firefox has it pretty soon. It's either in a nightly or whatever else. It's an ECMA standard for allowing a function to run when you have a property set. So you can pass in some name, of like, uh, I don't know, some variable and some function to run whenever it changes, right? So you effectively have getter setters that work cross browser in an efficient way without having to do the defined property insanity that doesn't work cross browser and it's whack. There's a problem with that, twofold. Number one is if you call code outside of Angular, like let's say you're using uh, something in underscore and you're gonna do a timeout and you're not gonna use Angular set timeout, right? Anything in Angular is like that, right? That's why when you see things like set timeouts or eval or things like that, it's all Angular's wrap around it, even for window, to allow the three things. What are the three things, right? Number one is fix eval behavior or whatever wrapper it's doing. Number two is allow to be mocked for unit testing in the dependency injector, right? It knows to look for them. And number three is to support the digest loop. So if a function has to execute inside of Angular's call stack, it can make sure that the actual digest loop happens so it can say, all right, your model has changed. I need to let all the bindings know that things change, right? 
Backbone doesn't have that problem. Just dispatches change events and calls it A. Angular doesn't have that problem because if you're coding in Angular, you never notice it. Right? The only time you notice is if you do asynchronous stuff outside of Angular's context, you have to use that whole thing you'll see a lot, which is really obnoxious, called scope apply. <laughs> and you actually put like your callback function in there. Say, call this function in an Angular context. Really obnoxious. Okay? That goes away in Chrome 36. Polymer does it completely different. Polymer checks every 250 milliseconds per one of the older builds. If it, a newer browser detects object observe, uses that. But if it's an older browser, like pre-Chrome 36 and some of the older Firefoxes and definitely IE and all that other stuff, and WebKit, you'll use a quest animation frame to make sure it's efficiently as possible checking the diff changes, right? You can call and uh, I think it's either update or I forget the function name, but it's very similar to flex and validate where you can say, all right, all my dirty flags, just invalidate right now, redraw, my data's changed. I'm tired of looking at this bug, right? <laughs> so you can do the same thing in Angular. But the point is, is that... This is supposed to be a built-in, native, simple way of using raw JavaScript without any, you know, libraries on top. And they'll a lot of times put them on in the controllers. So when you go back to our controller example, you'll see models put like uh, some value equals cal. That's a model, right? And then you can bind to some value in your HTML. So when you see tutorials and stuff, and they're binding to like objects. You're like, how is this crap changing? Well, that's how. Behind the scenes, using scope that apply with a digest loop. Otherwise, it's using object observe which is native and fast and all that stuff about Angular doesn't scale with 20,000 bindings or whatever it is. Like, no one cares, dude. <laughs> You're not going to run into that. When's the last time you had a performance problem in Backbone and you weren't working on an agency project and you didn't have to show 50,000 records from some crackhead Java developer going, here's some soap. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's be pragmatic. So that is your crash course. That is raw. That is tough. Hopefully it gives you enough information to get an understanding of the whackness of Angular. I know it was really quick. It was completely unhearsed. But so many people have been asking for it. I had to get it out there. So hopefully this was helpful. If you got any other questions, hit me up in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe on Google Plus and Twitter. Or you hit me up an email. Good luck.